Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, M2A 521, I will be talking about crystal or glass shaders. They can get very complex if you want to add all the little details and structures to it. So in uh, this video, in episode one, I will be trying to show you how I can set it up and how you can use some of my techniques to create really amazing looking uh, gemstones or um, ice blocks or something like that. So this is kind of the reference I'm going for. I always do that beforehand, look for references, compile them together and always have them um, visible while I work. So I really enjoy the the transition of, of this white stuff at the bottom, which goes up and cracks up the, the gemstone. And you can see there's some iridescence going on here, some broken up um, bump maps and all that. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to achieve something similar to this. Obviously it will not be exactly like that because I won't be doing any texture work. It will all be procedurally done. Uh, but before we jump into the whole endeavor of creating this fancy stuff, there will be a short promotion um, section going on. So I'm starting with my Patreon channel as always. And I know uh, you can get all the source files and scene files of the tutorials. Actually, since M2A 205, I have been uploading all the scene files. So if you wanna get access to that, be sure to um, sign up for the source materials tier and you get always access to all the tutorials and whenever i publish new stuff you will automatic you will automatically get the access for that and obviously if you want other things like support or promotion um some help on your uh on your portfolios i'll be happy to help you out if you subscribe to the uh, proper tier and then as always i'm on instagram i push my stuff out there so you can be part of the journey of creating new stuff so it's there you can see my tag up here if you want to join me right there. And then I have also the light shader library, which is a plugin for uh, Maya, for Nuke, for Katana. And it would look like a menu where you have some helper tools, attribute control, light control, some fancy things to help you out in your day-to-day -day work. And as a last promotion thing, I have my first app in the app store, which is called Surface 2.0, um, where you can actually visualize all your materials in your environment using AR kit, which is kind of a real-time augmented reality. And you always uh, get measured RGB values for any type of metal material you can think of. And as I said, you can place some objects in the scene and look at them in real time. So that was the kind of promotional phase. So let's dig into Maya and try setting up some nice looking gemstones. Right, so the first thing, let's bring up the the um, the reference files again. So first, the first thing is you can see on the left, the, the gemstone looks pretty clean, really hard edges everywhere. So the first thing what I try to do is add some bumps, some breakup to the whole thing. And to do so, I will create some, um, some edge breakups using occlusion. And also I will use the curvature shader. So let's jump uh, into that. But before we start, I just want to show you the Arnold version I'm using so you can follow along. It's M2A 3.01 with the core 5.110. So they keep, uh, Arnold or Solid Angle keeps pushing updates. So I just want to make sure that we're on the same page here. And I'm using progressive render steps on a random bucket order. So it's a bit more snappier as, as before. I have a dock and render region which you can toggle in toggle in your uh, window dock and out of out of region so i have that enabled and i have depth of field enabled just to get a bit more beautiful renders going on um, they should not impact render times at all it just should be a bit more noisy in the back anyways okay so i have the crystal shader assigned you can see if i change this it adjusts and uh, the first thing which i want to do is um, work with the edges right so to get that going um, I will be using a curvature, a uh, occlusion shader. Uh, you might think, why not curvature? I, I'll show you in a bit. There's like a slight difference between those two nodes. Uh, let me just render a smaller portion. So whenever I create a node, the render doesn't really update. So I have the AI occlusion and I have the AI uh, curvature node. And the bigger difference is or the one which I find very interesting for the occlusion is it has a built-in uh, normal slot. 
And I don't think the curvature does have it. There is no normal camera for this guy. So that's why I prefer using occlusion. Uh, you can get the same results if you change some settings in the occlusion node to, um, to get this uh, curvature effect. So I'm just plugging the out color to my ID slot, which is just a, a temp slope, which you can work with. It doesn't affect the shader. It's mostly used for writing out AOVs, uh, but I won't be using that. So enabling isolate selected and selecting the occlusion. This is what the default occlusion looks like. And that's something I would expect as well. But I want to invert the normal. So it just takes the inside faces and I want to invert the black and white. So whatever is uh, white should be my um, my output mask. And then obviously you need to change the scale. So let's go a really sl uh, small value of two maybe. And you can see that I'm kind of getting the same effect as a curvature node. And I can uh, prove you that if I connect the curvature and I do select for isolate selected for the curvature, you kind of get the same thing if I would increase the radius. So very similar results there. Um, just make sure you have self only for occlusion so it does not affect if similar objects get closer to it. So that's the one thing. Uh, and now comes already the first little kind of advanced hidden feature within the occlusion node, which is a very nice feature. Um, you can directly, as I said, plug in a normal map in there to get some really interesting edge breakups. So I'm creating AI noise. And let's try to connect this directly to the out color and see if it helps. Uh, I don't think it will work directly. Let's just, I don't, because normally what I need to do is create a normal map. So I always use a AI bump 2D, which connects to the noise or where the noise connects to, and then it connects to the normal camera. And now the occlusion looks a bit different, which is more or less what I want to get going. So we just need to adjust the height and we should be good. And you can see what's going on now. So I'm using the bump to create a breakup in the occlusion. It's a very interesting effect and it, it can really get some good details out of your shaders. So uh, before we continue, we would need to increase the details. So let's just increase the octaves to maybe five. And you can already see now what that did. It's like there's a really amazing breakup going on. Um, and then you should actually, you can play around with all these values. You can use um, a vector instead, and then you can use an AI 3D uh, bump 3D, which is not a two-dimensional two bump. It's a three-dimensional bump, which is more interesting. Uh, let's see if there's actually a big difference. Uh, we need to increase the height again like that. And uh, let's see if there's a difference. There should be a slight difference in the Z axis because that's the only component which gets added to this. But all in all, I think uh, this, this will work. And now we can play around with the epsilon values, uh, which is kind of like a detail adjustment. You can see it's more cloudy now and it adds slowly more details to everything. Um, so small value um, keeps all the details from the map. And it's kind of like a blur of the detail, I guess. And then you have the height, which is just an overall contribution to the strength of it. And you can see now this is a way more interesting um, result than the previous one. So we can then, in, uh, uh, after setting up this breakup, we can just plug this back into a um, Bump2D node. So let's just create an uh, Bump2D. So the result from the occlusion uh, we'll directly plug into the bump slot for the shader. So if I would connect this to the normal camera, we should get some bump effects going on here. And then obviously you can change the height and you see what's going on. You get this breakup, obviously too strong, but you get the idea. You can also go into negative space. So if you want to have an inverted one, you can just go in the negative side. And I think this is where we want to go. Maybe not as much, but something similar. So this would kind of resemble similar, something like this. Uh, where is that? Um, maybe something like that. And then again, you can combine different, different uh, bump maps together, create interesting, more interesting results. Um, let's see, and we can for sure add some distortion to it. So it's uh, even more swirly 
scratch like bumps you can see that pattern now ha happening which is a lot nicer and we can now try to um, actually break up the displacement or the edges with a displacement we can see if that works with the curvature better so just creating AI curvature node and oh, we actually have this right here which is fine isolate select it on and let's do that okay so now let's try to get um, a nicer edge without the black spots in the middle so you can play around with the bias and increase the multiplier to kind of get rid of this bad edge and the more samples you put in the more accurate your result will be and the cleaner for sure um, so we can just try to actually use this either for a, a roughness map because most of the edges of the crystals are pretty worn out and rough uh, is there like something like this you can see the edge is pretty rough and dented so we can use this directly as a roughness map and we I think we should do it and combine it as well with this to get a very interesting more um, in, uh, yeah, detailed roughness map as well so this would be we can try to plug it into displacement I don't think the shader works like that because the shading points are calculated before the um, oh, after the displacement, the geometry displacement is happening. So let's we can try it, but I don't think really it will work. Maybe I'm wrong. So if I connect uh, the red channel, I just need any float. You can use RGB or any float value. Uh, let's just stop the render because it, it happens to crash a lot if I play around with displacements and bumps and all that. So displacement goes into here and now we want to have a, we want to extrude, I think we want to extrude these edges. So uh, my zero value should be black, which is zero. And then one is the the edge which gets ex, uh, extruded. So this is kind of what we set, have set up. Uh, I think just uh, update the render and see what we get. Uh, not much just yet. As I said, I saved right before, so if we get a crash, we should be fine. Yeah, I just tried it again and it just didn't work. So you, I can't really plug in curvature to displacement and then hope for a render. So what I did in in the in my previous renders, I actually sent this geometry to ZBrush and broken up the edges. And I think I will do this now just to show you what I did and then we can work on the high res GR instead. So let me just export the geometry quickly and then I'm back in ZBrush. All right, so we're back in Z. And so the first thing which I wanna do is I, I wanna use Dynamesh. I don't wanna export a displacement map for now because this would be uh, another tutorial for itself. So I will be just using Dynamesh and export the high res geometry. Um, I know Arnold can handle that just for the tutorial sake. I think this will be more than enough. So let's just go to geometry tab, hit, uh, go to Dynamesh, disable blurring uh, zero and maybe go on a resolution of maybe 600. Let's try what we get. Uh, Shift F. So yeah, it's pretty dense, but that's exactly what we're going for, which is nice. So now you can, I will, I will just kind of do this rather quickly. Um, oops, what did I do now? I just want to hit L actually to disable lazy mouse. Okay. And I want to go to trim dynamics like that. And now we can do this. So we can actually do some nice edge breakup and I will bring back the reference as well. Maybe just place it somewhere here. Um, just so that we can see some edge breakups as well. So I like really this guy and maybe that one, but let's just work with this. So um, you can just use a trim dynamic brush to clean up the edges and break up all these guys some more. Um, but I will be using a alpha brush as well with the scratches. So I can kind of really quickly add some detail to all these edges. And just by doing that, we will get an, a lot nicer looking uh, gemstone and especially with dispersion and all these little shader effects, the more detail you add to it, the nicer it will look. Um, so just some scratches, inverted scratches. Um, 
I'm going really fast here. Just uh, obviously you should spend a lot more time on this to, to get some nicer details. Um, but for tutorial sex, as I said, I'll just kind of try to rush it and don't waste your time on this whole thing. And these deep gorges, they really help to sell cracks and and rocks because everything you can see is really choppy and broken up. And I'm just trying to kind of recreate that. And we will also do some um, some other sh brushing techniques. And also just that, you know, I'm not a really a ZBrush guy. I don't really know what I'm doing here. I'm just scratching the surface as you literally actually. Um, so yeah, I'm just getting my hands around it. There's so many options in ZBrush. It's very powerful. Um, yeah, so I like to use the, um, the Damien as well. Where's that guy? Oh, we can actually just move them as well. Oops. Hitting F. I just, because the, these edges are so perfect, I like to just, uh, kind of move them just to break it up some more. So it's not hundred percent accurate. Yeah. Let's just do some more, uh, trim dynamics. Just a few more things like this one is very clean. So we can just uh, do some stuff. We can also add some noise patterns. These things are a bit too clean. So let's just remove the alpha and just clean this up, make it flatter, something like that. And just even just by doing these like kind of flat parts, just these little things help to break up the edges, make it more interesting. And this is all what it is. Create interesting edges, soften them, smooth them, add some more details. Um, not no masking. Not sure what that was, but we can just leave it. It's it's something different, not always the same repetition. So if you hit B and you hit, I think, D for damn standard. Uh, did I select it? I think I did. Yeah, you can just add some like deeper gauge, gauges or something, which is very interesting. Something like that. Not sure what it is, but maybe we just undo this step. This is weird. And as you can see, I'm trying really to, to not waste your time. So I'm kind of rushing things a bit. Um, but as I said, spend some more time on this to create interesting edges. And you can also export displacement maps instead. If you have nice UVs, this is definitely something you can do. Um, if you don't have them, obviously go the procedural way, which I'm trying to show you. Um, but yeah, so this is one definitely one way of adding detail pretty quick. More edges doing this on the top is very clean. I think we're almost done here on the ZBrush end. Um, there are different, still lots of different brushes which you can use to add some more detail. Um, okay, but I think uh, if you if you check the before and after, I think um, I think this will be good enough. So we, I guess we have pretty pretty high poly count now. Um, Four hundred thousand is actually not too bad. So let's just say export. And we just go uh, to to M to Maya, and then we say uh, just to M is fine, I guess. Okay, so I just exported that. Exported done. Let's head over here and see if everything worked as expected. So if I hit File Import, uh, we should find to M right there. It's twenty six megabytes, and it should fit right on top of the low. Uh, low res version. Is it there yet? There it is. So we got some messy things because it assigns a shader. We just need to clean this up quickly. Is the render still going? No. Okay, that's the occlusion. This guy, it's a bit slow. Let me just sort this out quickly. All right, so I just hit the low poly geometry and I assigned the same shader. So this is now the high-res version of it. So you can see all the nice edge breakups. So this is kind of something I tend to do as well. 
um, but it's, it shouldn't be too crazy and obviously the poly count is a bit higher now we've got now 400k but it's honorable will easily handle that so that's not a problem at all so let's just uh, kick off the render and see how this looks now with the higher geometry okay so it's cooking it's cooking and you can see now we got more interesting edges here definitely a more interesting result than before uh, we still have a pretty white shader so normally i would light stuff in uh, 0.8 gray which is a default for the industry which is 18 18 percent gray and a roughness value of maybe 0.55 for a typical gray lambert sphere which you would see on set and you can see we got these nice edge details now uh, very interesting i think still the bump is a bit too strong um, but this would be the first thing i would um, work with so i think this is something to um, to set up for a glass or crystal shader i just which should just work a bit more on the bumps so there is one little trick which i tend to use and especially if you have a procedural setup what I tend to work with is a world position pass and you, you can't really access the shade the, the stuff from the shader so there's a hidden or a not so used node which is called AI state vector uh, which is pretty cool because you can access lots of things directly from the object so shading points, uh, world position, uh, deri derivatives I'm actually not sure what all this stuff is, it's uh, pretty fancy things so i will be using po for will position pass and i will be converting this to a i think it's float there's an ai float to rgb which is you can also just use a ramp actually um, but i like to do this so i want to use the y channel y is the up vector so y connects to rgb and the out color for now just goes to the id slot and if it's save and I look through selected, you should be, uh, it should be clear what we see, I think. Well, not clear as, as uh, black and white, but you can see the values here in the bottom if you check them. So at the bottom, it's kind of around, around one and then the higher I go, the bigger the value. So this is kind of a Y ramp. And all I do after that is connect a rain shader AI range which is just uh, it has different different words in different DCCs um, so I think there is uh, um, levels is one of them a few so anyways I just use the range for Arnold and what it's doing you can just define a value range which you want to work in so if I save again on I enable smooth steps which is kind of a clamp between a different range and I want to clamp it from I checked the highest point was kind of 15, so I want to go from maybe uh, 1 to 15. So we already get the ramp, like so, from the bottom is 0, and it goes up to uh, kind of a white. And then for sure you can play around with the values to clamp them some more. And what I want to do is I want to have a stronger bump in the bottom of the gemstone and then a, a less strong bump value at the top right so this is kind of what i'm doing so this in the end will drive the bump height so and then you can just play around with the fall off if you need to and you see currently this is pretty uniform um the cutoff right and i want to have a kind of a noise pattern so it's not a uniform cut so again i will be using a ai noise here and this one will connect let's just see so what i do i just slide the value here and i can see what's happening and if i play with the min i can actually move it up and down and i want to have it in a range of maybe three up to 6.5 so this is always how i do it to to know the values and then i just plug the red channel or any other flow channel into the input min and then in the in the noise pattern, I just change my values from three to uh, what did I I have six point five I think it was, so like that. And now the noise is hardly visible at all, but you can see there's still some something going on. And in the range, you see directly what I'm what I'm trying to achieve. And so if I lock the isolate selected using the lock in the corner, it's locking it to that node, so I can easily change the values. 
So you can see now what I'm doing here. I can move it up, move it down. Let's see what we want to do actually. And I, obviously you can add more detail if you want to, to the noise and more distortion just for an interesting effect like that. And then you can also invert the map if you, if you need to, because in the end this should drive the, the bump height and we want to have a stronger value at the bottom and a less strong value at the top. So what we want to do is, uh, I think we can just invert these guys and we have an inverted map. So I want to have a base. So currently we have a bump value of negative 200, which is interesting, which is hard, hard to achieve now, I think, because the range does not go negative. So we would need to either disable the smooth stepping, which we can see what we get then, but I'd rather just uh, invert the map like so. Anyway, so let's just do a range of 200 like that. And maybe a, a really soft value of 0 0.1 or 0 0.10. So we have 0.10 at the top and we have a value of two, a 0.200. So let's plug this guy directly into my bump height. Uh, hit save and just see what we get now. And you can see we have a stronger bump at the bottom and then it kind of fades out for the top part. And now we can just easily play around with, my, with the range uh, shader and introduce some more stuff at the top. We can make the bottom stronger if need be. So now we have a really strong um, base bump and it's really fading off towards the top, which is exactly what I was going for. Um, okay, that's the wireframe. All right, so now we just need to invert it. So we can either do a multiplier or we can uh, swap the black and whites. I think that's the easiest way to do. If I just swap them out right here, Um, so I think if I just do a range again, I'm not sure if this will work. We can test it out. So let's just connect this here and then we just use this ramp as an inverter. So currently this is what it looks like. And if I just swap these two out, uh, we should have an inverted map. It is inverted. Obviously the ranges are now different. Huh, I think we need, uh, it's not that easy actually, because we're just changing the values, we're not going into negative values. So uh, let me think of something quickly. All right, so just a little, a little multiply divide node in between. So I'm plugging in the range color into the multiply divide input one, and then I'm just multiplying everything by negative one and we get an inverted map. And this will, this one drives now our bump map. So I think this is pretty cool and we can also play around with the roughness, but I think because the roughness is so tied into the glass, uh, this should be in the next uh, next step. So let's just clean this up a bit and see what else we can do um, in terms of m creating more edge detail. So we have a pretty basic one, so kind of like that. And so for the, I think we should now for the next episode, we should concentrate on the glass shader. So. The first part was to creating some interesting details on it. And then for the next one, we will be jumping into the gemstone material. So uh, thank you guys for tuning in for episode one. And as always, if you want to follow along, uh, be sure to become a patron to get access to the source, source scene files and follow along in the tutorial. And yeah, thanks for tuning in and I see you in the 